Sustainability and having a close connection to the land is a major piece of Native culture and knowledge. We all have the responsibility of protecting our environment sorry, for the next generation. And seeing the amazing turnout tonight is, makes it clear to me that we all share this value and that we care about sustainability and taking care of our land and making sure that our resources and our planet is here forever. Seriously, thank you all for taking your time to come here tonight. Seeing so many people here who are excited to learn about sustainability and enjoy some pizza really warms my heart. Um, yeah, not only did you guys take the time to be here, but caring is a good reason to prioritize being here. And so without your support and passion to learn more about sustainability and look out for the earth, none of this would have been possible. Okay, so with that out of the way, I think we have our wonderful um, panelists here. So we can go ahead. So we have plenty of seating available. If we're running out of chairs, um, we have some couches you guys can sit on. You're more than welcome to stand and we can pull over a few more chairs. Um, but yeah, I think we can go ahead and start the panel. I'll start by, I have a few introductory questions that I'll ask, and then we can go ahead and then add, take some questions from the audience. So let me find my notes. I was like, I don't need printouts, I can just use my phone, but now I have to look through my phone to find where all the notes are, so this was not a good plan. But hey, paperless. Yeah, that's, yes. <laughs> okay, we're going to start, start easy, so don't worry, don't worry. What is your name? My name? Uh, my name is Colonel Lou. I use he, him pronouns. Was there anything else I was supposed to say besides my name? Uh, we can just start with everyone's name, so okay. just pass it online. I'm Griffin Peck. I use they, he pronouns. I'm Sid Bauer. I use she, they pronouns. I'm Mike Reese. I direct the Renewable Energy Program at the across the river at the West Central Research and Urban Center. Yeah, so you kind of beat me to the second question. It's, what is your job title and how are you connected to sustainability? I'm the Renewable Energy Director at the West Central Research and Urban Center. My job is connected to sustainability in a number of different ways, uh, through agriculture, through energy, and uh, farm resiliency, and things of that nature. So we'll get into a little bit more of that. So I have two jobs. Um, one of my jobs, I drive for the City of Morris Transit. Uh, yeah. Yes, we got some big room support in the house, thank you. Um, and I also recently, as of August, am, I'm calling myself the coordinator um, of the Stevens County Organics Program. So we're starting, we're starting countywide composting. Um, that connects to sustainability because it connects to nutrients and the cycle of life and aroundness, as I've been call, telling the eighth graders at the high school. Um, and how does the transit uh, relate to sustainability directly through people um, and taking care of people and supporting people? Um, and I would also say the transit relates to sustainability through energy, right? And we're going to get an electric bus next year. So I'm going to be zooming around town. Yeah, we're going to be driving with the power of the sun. So lots of sustainability, lots of people, lots of fun stuff. Uh, so I am an energy intern uh, here on campus with the Office of Sustainability. Uh, I'm also an undergraduate student in environmental studies and sustainability leadership. Um, and uh, my main focus of my work is looking at energy usage and resource usage in our buildings on campus and understanding whether or not that makes buildings sustainable, not sustainable, and how we can use data to leverage better sustainability on our campus and leverage human health and wellness. We should share more for Griffin. Uh, let's see. Um, I work in the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Intercultural Programs, and I teach environmental studies. I think of myself as a sustainability force multiplier. Right, so like, you know, I have a bunch of sustainability things in my head, and then try to get it into like as many other people's heads, so that like, they can do stuff because I'm kind of lazy. I just sort of want to talk about it, so I can talk about it, and then like a bunch of people go out and like do things, and it's just like. <laughs> okay, um, I have one more question for you guys. For me, um, give us your general journey to sustainability. How did you get where you were? Where did you go to school? What kind of jobs did you have that led you to what you're doing now? Yeah, so I, I read the, the questions that we were given ahead of time, and I thought, that's going to be real hard for me to answer because I had a really winding path. So um, I actually don't think my path to sustainability was 
uh, educational or like vocational. It was actually just sort of where I grew up. So I grew up in a small town like in northern Alberta where uh, sort of like the kind of the Canadian oil industry sort of based. And so like I kind of grew up with like all these sort of things that like a lot of folks are like advocating about. Uh, it's just sort of things that happened where I was living, right? So like, you know, um, conflict between like oil companies and indigenous nations. That was like my friends, like, right? Like their parents having sort of like disputes about like how the, the land around where I should, we live should be managed. Uh, and then, you know, I, I went to school not really thinking about environmental stuff. It was just sort of one of the things like I was sort of involved with on the side, right? Like, you know, like a lot of you who are just sort of like do advocacy things. And then somehow that got more central to what I did until that's just sort of what like, people pay me to do, which is a little strange. Um, so I, my sustainability journey, I mean, I've always been interested in like nature and the environment and that kind of stuff. Um, but my journey with like building energies, that kind of sustainability started when I was in high school. Um, I went to this fun little place called the School of Environmental Studies. Ooh, some people in here, yeah. Um, um, and we, um, I, my senior year, I got involved in this LEED certification project um, there, and uh, progress had really stalled um, by that point because it was difficult to continue doing good work when there was uh, seniors always graduating and like leaving a project behind and not being able to. Like, you'd have to retrain people every year, and so it was really difficult to make progress on that. Um, I started it my senior year, kept working with it. As a freshman, I went to Normandale Community College, and I went and volunteered at SES, and helped to continue to run this LEED certification uh, process with the current students there, and myself, and with some of the faculty there. Um, and then we certified the building um, for LEED Gold Operations and Maintenance. Um, we were one of the first high schools in the country to certify with an all-student team rather than a team of building professionals. And the U.S. Green Building Council actually put out an entire program based on our certification experience so that it could be replicated at other high schools across the country. Um, from there, I knew that I wanted to go to a school that uh, centered sustainability within its uh, goals and within its vision. Um, for a while, I was really considering going to the Twin Cities, and then um, I, Julia Scovel, I don't know where she is, she might not be in here. Um, she uh, told me where she went, she told me she went to Morris. I came here and I toured the week before everyone got sent home for COVID in 2020. Um, I, think, I think the day I toured here was the day they canceled the Peru trip, so it was, you know, spirits were kind of low on campus, but I remember I came here and I saw the wind turbines and I saw the solar panels and I heard the message loud and clear from the sky that like this is where I was kind of supposed to be. Um, and then once I was here, I got hired in the Office of Sustainability and have been doing this work, so, yeah. I don't want to interrupt you, Sid, but like I did notice people coming in and out. If you guys have to leave or people are coming in, like you're welcome to like get up, get more pizza. Like this, is, this feels a little more structured and a little bit more awkward to like get up and like leave. But like if you have to go, if you got stuff going on, like, we're always happy to have you and like, do what you need to do. Okay, anyway, continue sit. Move those bones. Um, so, my sustainability story very much starts here, uh, in this place, in Morris, uh, because I was a theater kid in high school. Um, I was in the suburbs, I was doing musical theater, I was doing tech, I was doing stage management. My whole entire life revolved around the musical Footloose and Once Upon a Mattress and doing steampunk Sherlock Holmes, right? There was no sustainability in Sid's life back in 2013. Um, not, no. <laughs> doing a lot, of, a lot of stage management. Um, so I came up to Morris just as time to go to college, right? That's the thing you're supposed to do when you're in the suburbs, is you leave and you go to college. I came to Morris specifically not because of sustainability, not because of anything in particular, but because the vibes we're right, right? Like I care about how I feel in a place. And I came here and it felt safe and it felt homey and there's not a bajillion people everywhere I go and I like to know everybody. So the concept that I could know everybody here was very good on Sid's list. So I got here and I did musical theater and I lived in Pines so that I could walk 10 feet to do my musical theater, right? It was great. Yeah, I hope that's all. Um, 
And once I was here, friends of mine who had come here for sustainability reasons, um, people who are more aware of this concept of sustainability, which 18-year-old Sid was not at all. Um, she only knew about steampunk Sherlock Holmes. Um, got involved in energy work, and specifically in energy work because my brain and the process of stage management and taking multiple groups and sorting it into a nice, big, beautiful, visual explanation is what I can do. So Theater Sid and her color-coordinated highlighters did some energy work, and I kind of made visual maps of how all the energy on campus gets to where it goes. Um, I collected data and uh, just kind of turned numbers into visual talk about conversation pieces, right? So we're not just looking at five kilowatts. What does that mean, right? We're talking about a bigger visual picture. And I did that forever. I started doing that my freshman year. Um, and I worked on a bunch of different energy projects, on heating, on solar panels, on uh, district heating, on all sorts of stuff. And it hooked me, right? And it hooked me because of the people. So it's, it's community-based for me. My sustainability story is more about interacting and sharing and conversing um, and because of that so I came when did I, I graduated in 2019 and I originally came to school as a bio and a secondary ed major because I wanted to do talking about science and being excited and with the people the people being the kiddos and halfway through I said the education system is not for me the sustainability system though that's uh, flexible and wide-ranging um, and so I changed it right my story was like, oh, okay, learning about yourself, wow. And so I just, I did a lot of stuff. I feel like I've done a lot of stuff, and I'm now realizing that. Um, and after graduating, I told myself, it's time to chill, right? Time to not do a bajillion things all at once, time to sit around and drive my bus and breathe, um, and be nice to Sid. And the organics program is now happening because of the people, and because of the community, and because of the conversation. Um, this program is happening countywide, and so the position opened up, and it felt like a very opportune time for me to like restart my brain, you know, as opposed to like sitting numb in my house for two years and driving my bus. It's kind of a time to think, time to engage, uh, kickstart the brain. So my sustainability story starts in musical theater and ends in trying to think again and trying to learn how to converse again after a weird, confusing time for an extrovert. Um, but it's exciting to be here because I also once ran a sustainability forum, right? So I feel feel like an old 24-year-old over here. It's kind of fun, so a good story, a fun story. Oh, I knew I should have said it on the other side of Sid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, I, I think I'm the contrast person up here. I took a little bit different path than probably the rest of the group. I grew up in Hancock, which is down the road from Morris, and in my high school class was 21, I believe, and went to South Dakota State and had a, got a degree in animal science and then uh, farmed full time for six years and continued to farm, but went back to South Dakota State to go for grad school and went into ruminant nutrition to learn about how to uh, feed beef cattle and how to, how to uh, graze and supplement them and things like that. And, and after that, or while I was there, a uh, position opened up at the West Central Research and Outreach Center and Forages, and I thought that was a great opportunity to come back and farm and, and uh, go to, and also have a job. And, um, but even prior to that, the reason why I went back to, to grad school was twofold. First of all, I thought there needs to be you know, a better, better way to make money than farming. And when I look around, when I looked around at the time, and you, know, you put it in a tremendous amount of hours and a lot of capital involved and a lot of, worrying and risk and things like that and some years you made money some years you didn't make money uh, it wasn't like what my what my dad and mom had experienced where they uh, were able to support a family build a house expand the farm to support the family do things like that but i look around i would go to church i'd go to activities and i'd be the only young person in the community it seemed like and i thought well there needs to be a better way and I guess that goes gets into sustainability that you need you need uh, opportunities for young people and whether that's uh, being having farming practices that are profitable or having job opportunities and so that's why I thought it would be good to get into 
uh, the university and try to make a difference that way. So uh, through that process, I uh, started working uh, as the director, or as, as coordinator for the Renewal, Renewable Energy Program, which was just starting out for Lowell Rasmussen uh, here at UMM, and in our case, Greg Como, who was the director of our, of our research and outreach center. And they had a vision of bringing uh, wind energy and biomass to campus and to the research and outreach center. And part of that vision uh, was to improve rural economies and improve the profitability of farming. So I thought that that would sounds like perfect for my background. And so I started uh, working on that and take a lot, took a lot of pride in kind of developing strategies that uh, put us in the right track, along with many others, not just myself, but and through the years we've been able to be very successful at establishing renewable energy systems and, and moving the ball forward. And we haven't accomplished all our goals yet, but we're, I think we're well on our way. And, and as Lowell Rasmussen always said, he, he uh, said all the credit belongs to you as students and the students that came before you because that's, that's who was really driving the efforts at UMM. So uh, that's my path towards sustainability. One, one last thing that I've had an opportunity to do is to serve on the Legislative Assistance Commission on Minnesota Resources, which spends about $70 million a year on, on uh, natural resource projects. And it's through the state, so hopefully you're not gambling, but if you do, your dollars go into that. And <laughs> one thing you realize when you have that opportunity to listen to all the projects and the concerns people have is, you know, we, we live in a very fragile environment and our natural resources are, you know, we, we need to be paying attention to our natural resources, whether it's microplastics uh, getting into our lakes and affecting their fish, or whether it's nitrates getting into our groundwater. And so all those kind of come back to human impacts. All right, with that, thank you. <laughs> audience for questions. If you guys have questions, please go ahead and raise your hand. I think we'll start. Do you guys, should I pass the mic around or should I repeat the questions? I can speak up. Okay, we'll pass the mic. Okay, we'll start in the back. With little exercise. Yeah, sorry, Cam. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I'll wow, that's loud. Uh, so my question is mostly for Griffin. Um, so you do um, a lot of data collection on energy usage on the buildings around campus and whatnot. What sort of stuff does that data tell you beyond like the very obvious? Like how does what what deeper conclusions can you draw from that about like building about the community, etc.? Yeah, so um, building data is so I guess we'll start this by saying there's this metric, I don't know where it's from. I'm sure if you look for it you can find it. But there's a study done that basically looked at how much time Americans on average spend indoors. And it found that on average, Americans spend over 90% of their time in buildings. And so part of what tracking building data does is we can learn about human activities within the buildings. Um, we can learn about patterns within the buildings, patterns in building use. And then we can use data along with either surveys of the people who inhabit the building or surveys uh, from other aspects, and we can leverage things like better building operation policy. We can also make sure that the buildings are working for the people that inhabit them. So for example, if you were in a building and it was consistently too hot, and it was too hot for you to focus or to learn, that would be a good thing. And what that also tells us as building data managers and looking at building data is that that is a waste of heat energy. So what we can do is we can look at this data and we can look at what people are saying and we can say, oh, if this building's too hot, maybe we should not pump as much heat into it and then that makes the building more comfortable for people, it makes a better learning environment for the students in the building and we end up being more sustainable in the process. And so building data really informs how it, it can inform the decisions that we make when it comes to the operations and maintenance and how buildings should perform for the people that inhabit them. Well, I think I answered that, but yeah. And then you can just raise your hand. You guys have questions? Hi, so this is, uh, I guess, a two-part question for Clement. Um, first being, um, 
Could you describe the term environmental justice? And then secondly, maybe provide a couple, or one example of a local environmental justice issue? Oh, sure. That, um, let's see. I don't know if this is a, what the formal definition of environmental justice is, but the way I think about it is that when you're thinking about sustainability, what you're thinking about is how to reshape society so that we have sort of the benefits for the most people and for like, you know, the, the broadest sort of set of species in the long term. Right? We're just trying to think about like how do we have a society where we're supporting each other's mutual flourishing, where like everybody in the socio-ecological system is sort of benefiting as much as possible. Um, that's a value-laden sort of idea, right? Like to benefit involves sort of meeting the things that you're, you value, right? Getting the things that you value. And so environmental justice and like sustainability justice comes in by thinking about the fact that we have different ideas about what it means to thrive, right? To do well, right? To flourish for, you know, each of us is slightly different because there are different things that we want out of life. Um, and so we're always, when we're working towards sustainability, engaged in a sort of kind of big negotiation, right? We're making decisions as a collective on how to benefit most broadly for everybody. Um, but different people have different access to decision making, right? Power tends to be concentrated within any sort of collective of people. And so in radical justice and sustainable justice is thinking about like how do we have those conversations about the sort of benefits we're working at, the way we work towards those benefits, in a way that um, everyone's fairly involved, right? So like, uh, I think there's a lot of great examples around here. So like, thinking about like our U.S. food system, right? So U.S. food system concentrates all the production in like rural places, like here, um, but everybody sort of needs that food, right? But the thing is, what that means is folks who live here end up paying the costs for growing that food, right? So you're thinking about like, right? Think about the waters in Minnesota, right? So I think once you're pretty much south of the boundary waters, pretty much every body water is impaired. Right? Like I'm not a water person, but I think that's true. I think that's correct. I think yeah, yeah. So right. Yeah, right. And so the thing is, what that means is, we're drinking dirty water so that folks throughout the country and the world can eat, right? So that's not sort of a fair sort of like share the burden, right? We carry the burdens for, you know, the world's food system. Um, and so that's clearly an environmental justice problem, right? That we're, we're paying the costs for other people to get that benefit of having cheap food. I think that was the, that's the full question. I think, I think I saw one in the front. Okay, so uh, obviously, Wow, it's so weird to hear my voice over the speakers. Anyway, uh, obviously sustainability and uh, all those kind of things are a very hot button issue right now. And of course, because they're a hot button issue, everyone seems to have a solution that they put forward. My question is, um, what sustainability fad or like thing that people put forth is more unhelpful than helpful? Like what you know causes actual harm rather than the good that it's supposed to do? So a lot of my job right now is about garbage, right? Um, and a lot of focus of garbage that the big world wants us to think about is individual consumers, right? And we're all thinking about not using straws and all that kind of nonsense. Um, and that takes away from the bigger problem of we produce a lot of stuff and there's too much stuff and we wrap our stuff in plastic, right? And so one of the hot button issues is what can you do individually as a one single human person to change the world? And the answer is you can, you can say a lot, but you can also say not a lot because you're one single individual human person, right? And so talking about waste in terms of the collective community and how our system works is more beneficial to us than talking about like the one rapper I had at my house, I'm such a bad person, right? So the unhelpful thing is the individual aspect of it. And the thing we want to do, the thing we want to think about is the people, connectedness, and how as a community and as a society and as a greater whole, why do we have so much garbage, right? And why are we putting it in these places? So it's systemic, as we know, right? Yeah. I can see why you got out of acting because you wouldn't have never made. Oh, that. I was not an actor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, one 
one thing that I think would is, is not very helpful is uh, sequestering CO2 underground. So there's billions of dollars that are going to be spent in the United States and elsewhere to capture the CO2 off of fossil fuel plants, pipe it up to North Dakota or up to Illinois or some other place and stick it in the ground. And we're, we're going to, all of us are going to pay for that to happen. And it just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to do that. There would be better ways to use that CO2 uh, other than sticking in the ground. Now, it could help the environment. You know, it could help 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 uh, you know uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions that, and climate change and all those things. But really, it doesn't address the core issue, which is that we're producing CO2 with fossil fuel. Um, I think we can probably go on to another question. Um, this is a question directed towards uh, Clement, mostly. Um, I want to be a high school biology teacher, and I was wondering if you had any tips on implementing uh, sustainability into lecture and lab or maybe a biology-focused curriculum. Oh, uh, see, I'm also not a biology person. But, <laughs> so, so I, I do think, um, I think sustainability can be integrated pretty much anywhere, right? So like, I think any sort of education is done for a reason, and that reason often is to get people prepared to be folks who contribute to our society, right? Folks who are sort of part of the body politic, or like folks who are like kind of contributing, like, right, the planning and like, you know, helping do whatever that is that people use their education to do. Um, and I think sustainability is sort of one of those all-encompassing problems, right? Because it is largely a conversation about how we want to shape our society so that right, we're, we have the sort of society that like, is the kind of society we want and that we can maintain. Um, and, and so biology or any other topic, I think, touches onto that, right? So like, I think if you're thinking specific biology, I think people should actually be kind of aware that, you know, we are, we live within a, an ecological system, right? Like, you know, um, folks who talk about sustainability often talk about like, right, like socio-ecological systems. Um, our communities aren't just, our communities are humans, right? It's communities of like all the other species that we affect and that affect us. And so understanding that and being able to like think about that, I think, is fundamentally important, right? And I, and I think any other field that where, you, where someone is teaching, um, it it also ties to like our well-being somehow, and being thoughtful about like how what you're doing in you know, that field ties into like you know one another's well-being. I think is sort of like a starting place to think about sustainability. Um, so you're all kind of involved in different aspects of sustainability. If you, like each of you, if you were given all the resources that you would need, what would be like the project or the assignment or whatever that you would do? Like what's your like dream sustainability project? All right, I kind of have like two answers for this because my current dream sustainability project is definitely like focused like maybe on this campus and then there's like a bigger dream. Um, I think my current dream project, especially for this campus and its sustainability, is to um, probably like I would centralize all of the like data collection in one spot in the Welcome Center. Um, and it would be automatic, so like there's no, it doesn't rely on myself or any other user to do it, it just tracks it automatically. And I don't know how much money that would be, but it would be probably a lot. Um, and then beyond that, I think uh, a really, something that I'm really passionate about is engaging like high school students in this kind of stuff, because that's where I like became engaged in sustainability, and so I think engaging students who are in high school is like something that I really like want to find a way to do at some point in my career. So I think it'd be cool to like launch like a nationwide like sustainability benchmarking program for our students. So my first thought on this is in direct relation to what you just said uh, because I was an energy student working on 
data and collecting data and information. So when Griffin first came to Morris that day that everything shut down um, and started working on all of this stuff, I kept getting emails that they were editing my Google documents, right? So like the fact that Griffin's like, we gotta fix the data collection system. I'm like, yes, we do. And so that's exciting. Um, thank you for editing the documents and doing the good work. My other thought about my dream project is that I have no idea. And if I had all of the resources and all of the capacity, I would shut down uh, my brain would stop working. And after that point, I'd like take a long nap, you know, and I'd maybe realize what was going on. And then I would want to bring the people together, right? So with all of the resources and with all of the capacity, I would want to, want to give us the room to breathe and like take that nap um, so that we could come together as the collective people and learn from each other. Because I have no clue what a good project would be, but I bet like the collective in this group, we could come up with some pretty cool stuff, right? And we could come up with a bunch of intersecting ideas that bring the whole even better, right? So my dream would be one, to breathe, two, to let you all breathe. Breathe with me now, please. Wow, we've done it. And then to come together as a collective whole and do it as a team, right? So look, we've done some of that already, and that's pretty cool. Well, we, we might get this opportunity, so uh, in the infrastructure bill that passed, there's eight to ten billion dollars for hydrogen hubs, and so that, and also in the Build Back Better bill that passed the House, there's three dollars a kilogram for hydrogen production. That might not mean a whole lot to all of you, but what it translates to is billions of dollars available for uh, building out hydrogen infrastructure and hydrogen projects. And my dream project would be to to decarbonize agriculture uh, using hydrogen, and in our case, in hydrous ammonia. Uh, and hydrous ammonia is a nitrogen fertilizer, but it can also, it's also a hydrogen carrier, so we can uh, reduce the uh, fossil energy footprint and greenhouse uh, you know, gas emissions from agriculture by using uh, green ammonia for fertilizer. We can use that as a fuel for grain dryers and tractors and trucks. Uh, but the neat part about it is also we can use it on the, on the energy side for utilities to bridge the gap between their wind and solar to reach 100% renewables on their systems, whether it's electricity or, or thermal energy and, and gas. So uh, the thing about it is, again, we might get this opportunity. So uh, stay tuned because we're going to go after that. And we, I think we're going to have make a strong case that where Minnesota should be the hydrogen hub for or at least one of them for the nation. I was going to say what Sid said. We <laughs> <laughs> can just do some breathing, Clevin. Um, take some naps. Clevin and I got it. We'll do the nap. Other questions? I'd say that. Oh, this would be loud. I'm very good at it. Let's do it like this. Okay. Um, I have one question actually going off of that about hydrogen power. What role does that play in our energy infrastructure? Is it good? as uh, fuel for vehicles or would it be practical to build like a hydrogen power plant? What niche does that fill and what benefits does it have over alternate energy sources? Well that's the cool thing about hydrogen is that it can address all those. It's, a, it's an energy carrier so uh, when, you, when you talk about energy storage for utilities a lot of times you're talking about batteries which is, which is great but you're also talking about uh, long duration energy storage that's stationary like they have these concrete blocks that you raise up, uh, use like excess electricity, and you drop them down, and you, you run generators like that. So there's all kinds of different ideas, but that's the nice thing about hydrogen is it has so many uses. You can produce it from uh, wind and solar and uh, biogas and biomass and uh, other sources. You can uh, use it in for fertilizer. You can use it for green other green chemicals. You can use it for uh, transportation fuel uh, and for power generation. So that's why I think it's 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 so important. Um, you know, we've we've been looking at hydrogen for decades. We, as in the United States and in the world, and, you know, we've been looking at it for decades, but we really haven't got to the point where it's where it's ready for prime time. And I think we are at that point now, especially uh, with these uh, you know, with the federal 
policy now that might enable some of these projects to go forward. Mike, are you doing any of this up at West Route, perhaps? Do you have some of these things going on here in Morris? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sorry, I work with these every day, so I don't, I don't <laughs> convey to you, all of you them. Yes, we, we uh, have the first wind to ammonia project or pilot project up at the Research and Outreach Center. We established in 2013, first in the world. Uh, there's two other ones now in, in existence but there's billions of dollars going in worldwide into wind to ammonia, and by the way, you need hydrogen to produce ammonia, so that's why I uh, say that. And we, this past year, we received about $30 million of funding to put in a next generation wind to hydrogen to ammonia plant, and also look at using uh, hydrogen and ammonia for power generation, and we're, we have projects looking at using ammonia for uh, grain drying, we've, we've already fueled a tractor with ammonia, so yes, it's a big area for us. <laughs> okay, so I have a question for Sid, and I know that you are part of setting up Morse's new compost system, and I was wondering if you could talk about um, your experiences in that process, any challenges you might have, especially in the context of pushing for environmental initiatives in rural communities? Yes. Um, so my first question is, those of you who did not come talk to me at my table, do you know where our garbage goes? Yeah. Brian Herman does, right? It says me. <laughs> That's good. Good job, Brian Herman. Anybody else have any idea where our garbage goes? Yeah, it does. Yes, Nick does. So we got some people who know, a few people, right? But nobody went, besides Brian, like there was not enough hands, right? So. A little bit about the compost program and what's going on is that our garbage currently goes to one of two places in Stevens County. 50, it's split pretty much 50-50. 50 percent of it gets shipped on a truck all the way to Gwinter, North Dakota. That's like two, three hours away from here. Um, every single day, a truck drives all the way out to Gwinter, North Dakota and dumps a bunch of garbage in a landfill. It's a giant mountain. It sits there forever. Um, the other 50 percent of our garbage, I will swap my hands, goes to Alexandria. And there's a facility there called the Waste to Energy Facility. And basically, it's very Toy Story-esque. They dump all the garbage in this big room, and a big Scooby tractor guy puts it on the conveyors, and the conveyors start going zoom, 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 and they're sucking on the plastic, and sucking on the cardboard, and stuff spinning, and ripping open bags. It's very dramatic. Everybody's wearing hard hats and like acting chill, but it's not chill at all. And then there's these cranes, and the cranes are like at least as big as this stage, probably bigger, and they come down, and they, all the garbage gets sh shot into a pit. Pit of garbage. It's all been zapped around. The cranes come down. The guy who's Oh my gosh, I'm freaking out. The guy who's controlling the cranes is sitting in a big swivel chair and he's got joysticks on each of his armrests. And he's sitting in this room with glass and he's looking over the pit. And he's controlling the cranes and they, this is the best part. The cranes come down and they pick up all the garbage and they drop it into an incinerator and they burn it at 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. <sighs> Whoa. It doesn't stop there. There's a lot of facilities where they just burn the garbage. And it's like, okay, fine. Um, the heat from the fire is then used to produce steam. And the steam heats uh, Douglas County Hospital. It heats Alec Tech over there. It heats 3M. It goes to processing and manufacturing at 3M as well. And so either your garbage is going to a landfill in Morris and it's sitting on a mountain forever and ever, or it's getting burned at 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, right? The organics program was started because our neighbors who run the big burn facility, they've been doing organics for a few years now, and they've been shipping all their stuff to St. Cloud because there's nothing anywhere near us, right? As it is, um, no facilities available. And they said, no, 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 we're not going to St. Cloud anymore. We're gonna build a compost facility. So they're building one right outside of Hoffman, which is 35, 40 minutes away from us, pretty close. And they said, neighbors use this. So we said, yes. Um, and Stevens County applied for a grant through the MCCA and they gave me a bunch of cash to buy stuff for everybody in town, right? And what I'm telling everybody in town is organics are heavy and wet. We want to get the heavy stuff out of the truck that drives all the way to North Dakota every single day. We want to get the wet stuff out of the fire. That doesn't make sense. Why are we burning wet stuff? Makes zero sense. So that's the goal, right, of the organics program is to manage our waste in the big systemic way more efficiently both because it's good environmentally, yes, we should use our nutrients for stuff instead of just burning our nutrients, but also the system as a whole will be more efficient and it will help our waste costs, which will be going up for the rest of forever, right? It will help us have some control over how fast they're going up or when they're going up. Um, 
because we have decisions on where we're going to send our stuff. And so that's how the program's going. That's why we're doing it, because there's garbage and it's wet and we don't want it in the fire. Um, and then having those conversations in rural areas is shifting it from, I'm saving the world. I'm not. I'm telling you where to put your trash. And we're shifting it to, we are a collective community. Um, these choices have impacts on all of us. Financially is a big one. People like to talk about money. They like to think about money. But also efficiency. People know not to put wet stuff in a fire, right? Like, duh, that makes sense. So it's talking about how we can make our community function more efficiently um, and healthier for all of us. And talk about it in a fun and exciting way that's not just trash, move it, and like dollar signs. It's like, there's a fight, there's a crane, and he's scooping, right? And it makes it a lot more exciting. So part of the fun of talking about this is that I get to talk about it with so many people because it is a rural area. I get to chat with everybody, right? Like, I know all my neighbors. I know everybody who we're having the conversations with. So it's about the conversation. It's about the excitement. It's about shifting focus from saving the world to bettering our community in realistic ways. I've heard of a, I've heard of a few ways that we could get rid of like all the plastic. Like I've heard like there's caterpillars that can eat plastic and stuff like that. How sustainable are those methods actually and how realistic are they? Is this for me? I have no clue. All of you. Okay. I have no clue. Show us how caterpillars do I can scoot on the floor, Mike. I'd do it. You'd be more embarrassed than I would, Mike. You'd be like, why is she doing this? <laughs> um, and my first thought is, I don't know. And my second thought is, there's probably more efficient ways to think about it, right? So it's, we can buy the materials that our area can process. And that's probably the better option, right? I'll add to that by saying, instead of finding a way to deal with plastic waste, we should just stop using plastic, period. Because... <laughs> so, something that Clement emphasizes is in his courses, and is emphasized in a lot of other courses on, camp on this campus, is something called systems thinking. And uh, systems thinking uh, can be a little bit intimidating when you first start, start thinking about it, but the, kind of the gist is like, why would we try to put a band-aid on like the result of something when we could just like fix the thing that causes the problem in the first place? So I guess my that's why I say like stop using plastic because if we want to, uh, to find a way to deal with this thing that is pre a pretty big nuisance, it, sh it, it would be way, 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 way easier to just stop using it than to like develop like a new way to like get rid of it. And even then, I don't know if you can even really get rid of it, but yeah, all right. Oh, but so hold on. I know you're going, you're going somewhere, but okay. But, but, but I saw Janet had her hand up and I think that she should get to ask a question. Yeah. All right, we're going to follow them because we're fine. Okay, well, because it's for Griffin, so um, that's where he wants me to ask the question. Um, it, it's a sub. Um, Griffin, you're excited by data and tracking, and uh, we want to know more about why. What are the uses that you see for collecting that information beyond simply saying, look at this interesting information? Um, what kinds of decision making do you see the data that you're uh, excited to collect being used in? Is social, economic, regional, other yeah. kinds of uses? Yeah, I think uh, so. I think I'm going to just talk about how it might apply here at the university with the data we've collected. Um, I think it can inform a lot of our decisions around which buildings might need to get a certain repair first, and which like help us order like what is our list of priorities in buildings and like where should we like put the little limited money that we get like where should we put it um there was a report that came out recently that 50 percent of our infrastructure is in need of repair that's more than any other campus in the entire system it's by a percentage so it doesn't even have to do with our size like we just like our infrastructure is bad we need to fix it and i think that our data can help us kind of like if take that 50% and make it like a more manageable number by like looking at what buildings we can like focus on first. 
Um, for example, like Bemler is, um, it, it's a very beautiful building, um, it's a historical building. Um, it's also, when you look at the data, it's like one of the like least sustainable buildings on the entire campus. Um, I've talked about this with a couple people tonight who are coming around during the fair. Um, but a good, a good way to think about it is the average home uses around 893 kilowatt hours of electricity a month. Um, Gay Hall uses anywhere between like 15 and like 25,000 kilowatt hours a month. Bemler, which is an office building for like 50 to 100 people, uses uh, 45,000 kilowatt hours a month. And that is because it was built when ventilation was opening a window. And it was built when insulation was closing a window. Um, and so there's a lot of different, there's a lot of examples of that on our campus and at, in campuses and institutions all across the country. Um, and so, yeah, we can use data to say this is a building that's important that we should work on. Um, I think that data can also help inform our decisions around um, human health and how we approach um, making our campus a better learning environment for all people. So if we know that there's a room or a building on campus that has really awful heating and we know that that impacts like students' ability to learn and ability to thrive in the building, then we can bring that data and that knowledge to uh, Ryan Ehrman in Resources and Ops or other people within the uh, you know, upper echelon of like people who make decisions here at Morris and we can say this is not just a sustainability issue, this is an issue of we're basically wasting money by, you know, overheating this building and it's impacting students' health and those are sustainability issues. Yeah, well okay, yeah, they're all everything is a sustainability issue when you think about it. But it's also using the data and the knowledge to leverage for the, a better environment for us all to be in, and a better environment for everyone to learn in, everyone to teach in, and, you know, then be more sustainable. So, yeah. I think that answered your question, Marcy. Yeah. Thank you. So, what would you say for any of you? in your sustainability journey has been one of the greatest struggles and what would you say you've been most proud of to see happen? Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, let's see. I don't know. I mean, I really enjoy the work. So like, I, 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 it doesn't feel like there's been much struggle, right? Like I feel like I'm doing something that's worthwhile. So, right, the work, see, right? Like, the, people always say, like, you know, you do what you enjoy and you never work a day in your life. I don't know if that's entirely true. I feel like I do work, but it's uh, doing stuff I think is fun. So, like, I don't feel like there's been much of a struggle. I mean, um, you know, maybe like 15 years ago when I sort of started, people didn't care about these kind of things as much. That kind of sucked, but like, people starting to care about them more. So, you know, I guess that's cool now. I don't know. Uh, maybe other people would have better answers. I have a pretty clear example of a struggle. Um, when I was, so before I was here, when I was a freshman in college and I was working on that lead certification project at the high school, um, I was working with community members, district members, and part of the, another important aspect of this is that that lead certification project wasn't, so wasn't the district didn't ask us to do it, the school didn't ask us to do it, we just kind of did it. And then when it you know happened, this, everyone was like, oh wow, this is really cool, but you know, we didn't have funding or anything for it, and we were like, whatever. Anyway, um, during that process, uh, I would go to conferences, or I would talk to industry professor professionals, or I would talk to other data managers that track data for financial reasons, or other stuff, or people who worked in the city. And as a freshman in college, without a college degree behind my name, um, I wasn't taken seriously. I had people hang up on me. I had emails that got, you know, I'd email people five times and never get a response. Whereas, you know, if my teacher emailed them, instant response. And it was because I was a student. And because since I didn't have a degree, and since I didn't have 20 years of experience in the field, even though what I was saying was important and was correct, it just wasn't like being heard in the same way that like, you know, it would, it would be if I was like a professional. 
Um, so it was a struggle. But then, you know, I think I've established myself kind of to a point and established my credibility now. So I feel like more confident in like talking about this stuff. But, you know, it's every day still so, like, you know, walk into a room and there's always going to be someone that might doubt you and you just have to be willing to overcome that, speak up for yourself. So. Will you say the question out loud one more time so I can hear your phrasing um, for my brain before I say anything? So like along your journey, what would you say has been one of the, one of the struggles and what would you say you've been most proud of to see happen? Proud of, that's what I needed to remember. So when I think of struggle, I think once again, I think always back to the people, right? One of my biggest struggles in sustainability in life, because life is sustainable in thinking, right, um, is being a young person and being so aggressively aware of all things that are going on, right? My brain is overloaded with content at all times. I am 24. Why does the internet exist, right? Like, there's so much going on. And the concept of being a young person, being the next generation, tasked with solving the problems, that sucks, always. Um, I hate that. Um, and so I would say that my biggest struggle, personally, um, is reframing my mindset and feeling my brain develop as I become 25 and I have a prefrontal cortex or whatever, um, and feeling that transformation and trying to solidify it in a reality that's not chaos and suffering and the downfall of everything for the rest of forever, right? Which has some reality in it. My brain will never fully escape from that. But my biggest struggle is finding my sense of who I am, where I am, perhaps why I am, um, so that the big old the big old party of life is more than just the chaos and the screaming, right? Because there's a lot of the chaos and the screaming, and it's overwhelming to be a young person in a pandemic, and your brain is like, oh, I'm an adult, I'm conscious. Pandemic. That's that's a lot. There's a lot going on constantly everywhere, right? And so it's finding the sense of self and finding the sense of place is a big struggle. And so something I'm very proud of um, in relation to that is that the county just hired me. They just said, here you go, here's a bunch of cash, here's the county laptop, drive the county car or wherever you want, and they trust me, right? It's not just you have to do this, it's we trust Sid. And Sid trusts Sid. I have confidence in myself to go holler at people at Willie's, to go to the old number one and bring them some stickers. I can do that, right? So it feels really good to both be like, who am I, why am I doing this, and also say, I'm Sid. I like stickers. I can do this. I can chat with people, right? So it's the combo of the combo of the chaos and also the knowing who I am and the finding who I am and having faith and trust in that. And the faith and trust that that will change too. And that's good and fine and terrifying and exciting. Oh, oh, breathing again. We're going to breathe again. Okay, so I realized I didn't talk about something I was proud of, so I'm going to add that in right now. Um, Towards the end of when we were doing the LEED certification project, um, on like the day that we like announced that we were certified to the whole high school, it was like our big Earth Day celebration where like everyone takes the whole day off of school and no one has class and we do like basically this like an entire day and it's like a whole thing. Um, but when we were doing that, um, there was a Star Tribune reporter there and he followed me around the building as I gave like a building facilities tour and took pictures of me and then a beautiful picture of me ended up on the like the front of the inspire section for the star tribune and it's like uh area high school is gold and like me explaining that and like talked about like how i was influential in that and so being in the star tribune that was pretty cool um or like the usgbc which is like the people who do lead they flew me out to atlanta for their like big national conference and like gave me a slot to speak in and i got to see obama up there which was pretty cool um, yeah, so there's been a lot of cool stuff, and like, I mean, this, this is cool. This is pretty cool, right? You know? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, Mike. Well, I, I think uh, we had some of the same challenges when we started working in renewable energy in 2001. Uh, you know, we go to various groups and 
to tell them our plan and whether we were asking for money or asking for approval uh, they basically said you're going to do what and in fact one one uh, funder said you, you need to work uh, longer hours and you know work at night and to get to prepare yourself better and it's like oh yeah that's what we're doing by the way and so that was challenging getting over that but uh, um, and we did so we, we we overcome those challenges and we and that's part of what I'm proud of too is just everything we've done here together in Morris and developing uh, the systems but also developing the reputation that Morris the Morris has in our community has I think that's that's really a highlight and being able to you know travel throughout the US or in the world and say hey Morris you're from Morris you're doing those great things in fact I've been at conferences and the guy next and our same table was talking about, hey, have you heard what's happening in Morris, Minnesota? And it was, it was, I was kind of interested to hear what he was going to say. <laughs> Those good things. Um, the other, the other part of, uh, you know, the, the challenge part of it, and I'll probably end with this, is that there's so many opportunities. This is a broad space. Sustainability is a broad space. Renewable energy is a broad space. Even when you narrow it down to decarbonizing agriculture, it's broad space. You only have so much time, you only have so much money. What are you gonna prioritize? What are you gonna put your effort into that will have the greatest impact? And you know, I think that's a good message to leave with all of you. What are you gonna put your time into? In your, you know, that's, your main, that's your main resource. I always say human resources, and we have Eric Buchanan sitting over here as one of the people that work in our program. <laughs> The bear too, but uh, you know, human resources, people are what makes the big difference. That's what matters. Money doesn't matter. It's people, and so keep that in mind. All of you have so much potential to make an impact on our community and our world, and just keep that in mind. It's it's you, but you need to prioritize and have a vision, a strategy, and then execute a plan for making it happen. Okay, so it is 6.59, so if you guys had questions and we didn't get to them, I'm really sorry. If you want to hear the answers, I'm sure maybe our panelists would love to give their email or stay a little bit and answer them. But before we go, I do want each of you, um, if there's one last thing you want to say or something you're doing that you want to plug or one last little, little thing you want to say from each of our panelists, you have 45 seconds or whatever until 7, so <laughs> let's hear it. I don't really have anything to plug, but keep up with the good work. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think this is a time of challenge when we think, right, we are all kind of collectively going through a, a challenging time, and I've been really impressed by how well everybody's been, like, right, continuing to kick ass, so, like, just keep kicking ass. I have something kind of to plug, but I'm also going to plug something of his work. Um, check out Just Sustainability, the podcast on all streaming platforms that you just come and Lou and other people from the community. I listened to it over the summer, and it is very good. I learned a lot. It was very fun. And um, for me, um, yeah, this was kind of like the big event that I was doing. Um, but like, keep your eyes peeled for other sustainability events, slash building data, slash that kind of stuff events throughout the year. Um, there is going to be some stuff coming down the pipeline next semester in terms of events and student activities and stuff. So just keep your eyes out and yeah, if you're interested in this work, just come talk to me. Um, I would, if you haven't been able to tell, I care about the people and I want to hear what the people have to say and I like having conversations with the people. And so my friends over here, Nick and Sue, They've been tabling for a group that we have in our community called the West Central Minnesota Climate Network. And basically that's what we do, is we have conversations and we talk and we figure out how we as perhaps people who aren't employed in sustainability, like I wasn't when we started this group, um, can just talk about it, can have conversation, can learn from each other, um, can grow via conversation and education, right? So if you're interested in just sitting and chatting and learning and breathing and napping, um, about sustainability, then you should definitely go see uh, Sue and Nick before you leave. Because uh, it's chill and it's casual and it's friends and relationships. And so that's what I'm leaving with is friends and relationships and breathing is what I got. I'm going to plug Ride the Electric Bus with Sid. Yeah. <laughs> and 
and also, uh, you know, take advantage of the solar system on top of a Morris liquor store. And Blaine, Blaine the city manager, is saying yes. And I'd like to just point out all the work that Blaine has done bringing solar systems, putting solar systems on the city uh, buildings. So I think you need to talk to Blaine tonight or some other time. Hey, thank you all for coming. Please fill out the exit survey so I can hear your thoughts for planning for Earth Month in April. Um, and yeah, that's it. Have a great night. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.